Hello, everybody. We are back. I am back. I'm assuming there's somebody out there. In fact, I know they are because I can see view counts and I know there's a little group of you who are following the Devil's Engine series and I'm really enjoying reading it to you. And uh, we are now on to the third book, The Devil's Engine. Hellwalkers. Ah! Uh, I put googly eyes on one of these ones and it was brilliant uh, but I don't have any so I can't show you um this is uh, the third book in the series Marlo Pan and Herc and Truck and Charlie uh well they made a bit of a mess of things in the last book because basically they led Ostheim the big baddie uh into the engine now he has both engines or rather the same engine but he's managed to combine it um which won't make any sense if you've just joined me now um and um they went to Meridiana for help and they accidentally led Ostone to Meridiana as well. Whoops. And now they are Well, we'll find out, won't we? But basically, um they made a, a contract in Meridiana's pool, which went disastrously wrong because uh, both Marlo and Pan jumped in and they shouldn't have done it together. And then Pan, the demons have just come and killed Pan, basically, and dragged her soul off to hell. And now they've done exactly the same to Marlo. Which means that both of them are in hell, and the last thing Marlow heard after he'd been kind of sucked down into into the underworld is he heard Pan's voice saying, "Open your eyes," and he did. Uh, so we are going to carry on exactly from there. That wasn't much of a catch up. I mean, to be honest, if you haven't read the first um, the first two books or listened to the first two books, none of this is going to make sense. And actually, even if you have read the first two books. None of this might make sense anyway, because this book is very complicated and it didn't really make much sense to me when I was writing it. But I was enjoying it so much, I thought, you know what, I'm going to keep writing it anyway. Uh, this book is dedicated to my wife, Becky. Hello, Becky, if you're reading this or listening to this. The dedication goes, uh, one of my favourite dedications, goes, I can't find it. To Becky, my awesome wife. If I had to walk through hell with anyone, it would be you, because, you know, it's called Hellwalkers. Uh, not that I'm saying our marriage is like hell or anything. Uh, it's amazing, and I love you uh, and our girls so much. Honestly, it's not like hell at all. That's just the name of the book. I was trying to be clever. Can I start over? Uh, so there we go. And the answer to that was no. Um, okay. It usually starts off with a bit of a recap chapter, which is what this is. We'll try and get through about four chapters today. I've got a deadline at the end of this week for a new book, so um, I might not have time to do much more this week. But I thought I'd get one done today because there's no one in and it's quiet. This chapter could only be called one thing, and it is called Welcome to Hell. Open your eyes. The easiest thing in the world and the hardest. Hardest because Marlowe knew he wasn't in the world anymore. He was somewhere else, somewhere far worse. Open your eyes. He didn't even feel like he had eyes to open. He couldn't sense anything. Not the beating of his heart, not the weight of his flesh, not the pressure of his eyelids. There was literally nothing left of him, just a lost soul adrift in the ash that had once been his body. Open your eyes. He didn't want to, because if he, ha if he opened them, then he'd know for sure where he was. There would be no going back. He would be able to see exactly where this journey had led him. With his eyes closed, though, there was no hiding from where it had all began. He could see himself now just a kid back on Staten Island, a kid with no memories of childhood, kicked out of school for being an asshole, for burning all his bridges. Yeah, Marlow Green, big bad hellraiser. He saw the day he'd left school, stumbling into an underground parking lot, stumbling into a war. Hell had come to Staten Island that day, and somehow, despite his cowardice, despite the fact he'd always put himself first... He'd done his part to send it back. Open your eyes. That first battle had opened his eyes, opened them to a world he never could have imagined, a world where demons were real, where hell was real. He'd been recruited into one of the armies fighting this war, the Fist. He'd become a soldier, a true hellraiser, alongside Herc, Truck, Knight, and the enigmatic leader, Sheppel Ostheim, not to mention Pan. A hellraiser for four years, ever since Herc had rescued her from Juvie for killing a guy who'd attacked her. Through them, he'd learned about a weapon, something ancient and something evil. The Devil's Engine. Make a deal with the engine and you could have anything you wanted. Money, fame and power beyond your wildest dreams. 
The Fist had been using this machine to turn its army into superheroes, giving them powers like invisibility, strength, speed, even invulnerability. And all it asked in return was your soul. Because once your contract was up, the demons came for you. They came to drag you to hell. Marlow had thought the risk was worth it, because it wasn't like your contract couldn't be cracked. The lawyers for the fist, quantum mathematicians armed with the world's best technology, could undo the Hellraiser's deals with the engine. They could free you up to fight another day. And the cost of not fighting the war, that was unthinkable. Because on the other side of this battle was a group called the Circle, armed with an engine of their own. And all they wanted was to open the gates of hell and flood the streets with blood. Not good. Open your eyes. He hadn't opened his eyes, though. He'd been blind to the truth. The fist had destroyed half of New York trying to get hold of the Circle's engine, trying to end the war once and for all. But at the last minute, they had been betrayed. Betrayed by the person Marlowe had trusted most, his best friend, Charlie. Charlie had been working for the Circle all along, for their commander-in-chief, Mamon. He'd found a way inside the Fist's engine and he'd opened the door to their enemies. Mamon had obliterated most of the Fist in one blood-soaked swoop and he had control of both engines. As far as Marlow had known, as far as any of them had known, it was only a matter of time before Mamon united the engines and opened the gateway to hell. There had still been hope though. One last chance to find the engines to win the war. And they did it! Together he and her companion and the others had found the physical location of the engine inside the world's largest graveyard beneath the streets of Paris. They'd found it, they'd entered it, and they'd been about to destroy it. Except Mamon was already there, Mamon and Charlie and their army, and they were already destroying it. Open your eyes. It had been too late to open them, too late to see what was really going on. Ostheim had always said that they were fighting to save the world, that Mamon was the bad guy, but Ostheim had been lying. He was the true force of evil, and they'd been doing his bidding. He'd followed them to the engine, finally revealing his true form, a demonic creature of immense power. And right there, Ostheim had killed Mamon and taken control of the engine. And now the barrier between this world and the realm of the demons was about to crumble. Open your eyes. There had been no time to think, no time to see. They'd been so desperate to fix their mistakes, to undo the harm they'd caused, that, that they'd done exactly what Ostheim had wanted them to do. Mamon's dying gift to them had been a name, Meridiana, his sister. They'd fled the engine and found her in Venice, a crazy woman stuck in a loop of time who'd managed to build an engine of her own. She'd offered to make them one final contract for powers to use in the fight against Ostheim, an unbreakable contract for a single soul. But Marlow and Pan had fallen into the engine together and made a deal side by side. <laughs> Armed with the ability to travel through space and time, they had found their way back to the engine, to an instant in time where Mamon couldn't find them, an instant in time where they could pull the bastard machine to pieces. Meridiana had told them to find the heart of the engine and destroy it, but their contract was corrupted. It was already unravelling. The demons were on their way. It was over. Open your eyes. Why, though? Why would he do that? Why would he want to see? The demons had taken Pan first, had pulled her to pieces and dragged her soul into the molten earth. Then they'd come for him. They'd shredded him, devoured him. His soul had been ripped out of his body, pulled through the void, up and up and up into the endless, into the darkness. Into this darkness. Endless. Unfathomable. This was hell, he knew. An eternity of nothing. And he couldn't even scream. Marlo? The word was a whisper, right into his ear. He tried to turn his head, reached out for it with arms he didn't have. He wanted to laugh, wanted to cry, wanted to speak, but he could do nothing but listen, willing the voice to speak again. An eternity seemed to pass before it did. Marlo? Not a whisper this time, but a voice, Pan's voice. And she sounded pissed. Marlow, she said again, you idiot. Pan, he tried to say. Marlow, just open your eyes, said Pan. You're not going to believe this. Open your eyes. The easiest thing in the world, the hardest thing in the world. Just open your eyes, Marlow, he told himself. And he did. Born again. This being hell, Marlow expected to see fire. But when he opened his eyes, there was only snow. 
It fell all around him, a blizzard of white against the dark, so furious that he had to screw his eyes shut again. He tried to lift a hand to his face, but there was still that gaping absence where his body had once been. Open your eyes, said Pan, her voice voice grainy like an old gramophone recording. He did as she said, and saw the snow again, only it wasn't snow, it was something else, something almost like static. What's going on, he wanted to ask, but his lips were numb. Everything was numb. Pan, I'm scared. He was scared. Not the adrenaline bomb of combat, not the cold sweat shakes of a nightmare. This fear was so much older and so much worse. Can you see me? said Pan. The snow was clearing, sunlight starting to burn through it. Marlow could just about make out shapes there, a person. The relief of it, of not being blind, of not being helpless in the dark, was almost as bright as the light. He lifted a hand again, and was surprised surprised this time to feel it respond. What's going on, he tried to say, but what came out of his disobedient mouth was more, I don't want to go. He tried to move his arm, tried to control it, grabbing hold of a fistful of what could have been dirt. He managed to blink again, and again, and each time the world swam further into focus. There was a person there, sitting to his side, just a silhouette against the sky. He reached for her, and when the person slapped his hand away hard, he pursed his lips and spat out a word. Pan? He blinked again, and suddenly the world was crystal clear. It was Pan, but she was different somehow. He couldn't work out what it was because the sky behind her was so bright, shrouding her face with shadow. Marlow, she said, chewing on the word. He looked down the length of the length of his body, most of his body that was, because right now he ended at the knees. He swore, a depth charge of panic exploding inside him. He tried to sit up but couldn't lift his head more than a couple of inches off the floor before his stomach muscles gave out. His mind was full of the demons who had torn him to bloody ribbons and he was lost in the memory of their fury, all teeth and claws and heat. They'd taken his feet, and what else? He groaned, staring at his legs, only to see that they were longer now, down to his shins. They were growing. What the... Pan laughed, a sound as strange as birdsong. He peered down at his ankles as they materialised from nothing, or maybe not quite from nothing. He could see tiny threads being drawn from the ground around him, as thin as silk, white and red and earth-coloured. They were being pulled into his flesh, knitted together into meat and bone. "'What's going on, Pan?' he asked. The words were still mangled, like he had a mouthful of caramel, but they were louder now. He coughed, testing the power of his lungs and sensing no sign of his asthma. His legs had sprouted two feet, and they in turn were dividing into toes. He wiggled them, and they responded, even as the last few spreads spiralled around one another to form his nails. His stomach cramped, and he rolled onto his side, waiting for the agony to pulse its way out of him. Down here he could see that the ground wasn't made of gravel at all, It was bits and pieces of what could only be broken bone, fractured skull, powdered flesh. Ribbons of skin and muscle seemed to hold it all together. He could make out the gaping hole of an eye socket, hundreds of scattered teeth. (sighs) He blew at a dusting of ash and saw a tube made of glass and filled with, with a liquid that was almost black, a spatter of silver spots swimming in it. There was something else there too, pieces of dark metal woven into the organic. They were moving, ever so subtly, the machinations of an engine. They were there in him too, delicate traces of gunmetal grey and copper inside his flesh. He held up his arm and they glinted in the light. Even now, tiny filaments of metal and flesh were settling into walls and shapes like tribal tattoos. Whirls. Whirls, I think you pronounce it. Whirls and shapes like tribal tattoos. There was a sudden urge to dig his nails dig in his nails and tear them out, but he clamped his teeth together and forced himself to breathe. He traced his fingers along his forearm, feeling the tickle. Then he patted his hands down the length of his body to make sure everything was where it was supposed to be. It was. And it was right there in the open for anyone to see, because he was stark naked. Oh, he said, slapping his hands to his crotch. His stomach muscles fluttered, threatening to cramp again. Sorry. Pan shrugged, circling him. When she caught the light, he suddenly saw what it was about her that seemed different. Her body was too thin, hunched over like an arthritic old lady's. 
She was wearing a faded summer dress, something that might once have had flowers on it, but the skin on her legs looked too loose, as if she was wearing leg warmers. The scum... The scum? <laughs> What's the scum? The sun shone through them, revealing crooked bones. She circled him, stalking like a vulture, making guttural noises in her throat, as if trying to dislodge a string of meat. <coughs> Pan, Marlow said. He put his knuckles to his mouth, chewing on skin that tasted like machine oil. What's going on? You really need me to tell you, she said in that not quite right voice, staring over his shoulder. Her mouth curled into a tight smile, her eyes as big as moons, as she said, look. He did. They were halfway up a mountain of dead things, forged of bones packed so tightly together that they were as hard as concrete. Scraps of flesh and hair were caught between them like an abattoir floor. More of these tubes and mechanical parts were embedded in the decay, and the ground beneath him seemed to thrum. Above him, a lightning rod of black metal jutted up from the top of the mountain, piercing a sky that was too bright and too dark at the same time. In front of him, too close to comfort for comfort, was a sheer cliff edge. Over it, stretching as far as he could see, was a landscape of ruin and decay. There were other mountains out there, towering cairns that might have been made up of human remains like the one he was sitting on. Those antennae pointing skyward. They had to be a thousand yards tall, maybe twice that, maybe ten times that. It was impossible to tell because the air was thick with dust, great clouds of it kicked into storms by a soft, warm wind. It had already formed a coating on his new flesh, and he ran a finger along it, seeing that it wasn't dust at all, but ash. He spat, waving it away from his face, squinting at the buildings that crowded between the hills. They might have been skyscrapers at one point, but that point had to have been centuries ago, because they were little more than skeletons now. I don't get it, Marlow said, climbing to his knees, then onto legs that felt too brittle to hold his weight. Where are we? Pan coughed the dust from her lungs, shaking her head. Do you really want to know, she said, that weird noise filling her throat again. <coughs> There was a flutter of movement inside Marlowe's stomach, something squirming down there. Something was wrong. <laughs> he snorted a humorless laugh. Everything was wrong. He had died. He'd been ripped apart by demons. His soul, or whatever you could call this part of him, had been dragged to hell, where he'd grown a new body out of the remains of a million dead. It was insane. It was impossible. The thought of it was a rat trying to claw its way out of the overheating bucket of his brain, and for a moment he was lost in a maelstrom of panic. The world rocked off its axis, and he straightened his arms to try to keep his balance. Deep breaths, in through the nose, out through the mouth, like his mum had always shown him, the oxygen like water on the fire of his panic. He waited for the rattle, for the gunk to flood his lungs, the way it always did after a panic attack, but... Excuse me, but whatever this new body was made of evidently didn't suffer from the same weakness as the old one. You may be in hell, Marlow, he told himself, but at least you can breathe. The right side of his face was burning, and he turned to see Pan watching him, her head cocked, her eyes wide. There it was again, the tickle of movement right in the middle of him. What? he said. You're laughing, she replied. Why? He chewed his knuckle again feeling his teeth grate against a shard of metal beneath the skin. He was glad of the pain. It meant that this body, however weird it was, was his. I'm not laughing, he said. It's just... Just what? Pan asked when he didn't continue. She took a lurching step towards him, her loose skin fluttering, one eye drooping. Don't you like it here? Like it? Marlow asked. Pan took another step in his direction, and he'd staggered back before he even knew it. He was conscious of the fact that he wasn't wearing a scrap of clothing, felt as vulnerable here as a newborn baby. The loose ground beneath him crumbled and he glanced down, the cliff edge too close. What are you talking about, Pan? Why would I like it? Then he looked up again. Oh, sorry, when he looked up again, she was even closer. Close enough to touch, and she lifted a hand and rested it on his elbow. Whatever his new heart was made of, it was hammering at his ribs like an old engine. And Marlow wanted to put his foot down and get the hell out of here. Because there was still something wrong with her. Not something there, but something missing. Pan, he said when she didn't answer. He tried to step to the side, only for her to step with him, her grip on his arm tightening. 
Her uneven eyes were huge and unblinking, and he could see himself in their wetness. He could see a version of him that was not really him. This place, it isn't what you think. It's not as bad as we thought it would be. She smiled, her teeth small and neat and dirty. I can make you like it, Marlow. I can make you happy here. She leaned in, still grinning, and the sudden smell of her made him reel. It was sweet, almost too sweet, like rotten fruit. And there was something else just behind it, something that could have been sulphur. Pan, he pleaded. She leaned in closer and he arced his back, feeling the drop behind him, feeling like it was yawning open. His foot slid again, old bone exploding into powder beneath his heel and falling into the abyss. Everything else was a lie, Marlow, she said, her breath impossibly hot on his face. All of that other stuff, it never really mattered. There is only here, and only now, and only us. Her mouth opened wide, too wide, a split appearing down the middle of her nose and in her chin like somebody was peeling her open with an invisible scalpel. There were more teeth there, lining the two halves of her face, needle sharp. He thought he caught a glimpse of metal, tiny components whirring like gears. Pan! he yelled, and she cocked her head again, her eyes burning holes in him. Marlow, she said, her voice distorted by her broken face. She laughed, and it was like a mourning cry, like a dozen sobs all echoing from her throat. When she spoke next, she spoke with more than one voice. Why do you keep calling me Pan? <laughs> next chapter. Here we go again. Pan pushed herself up, her foot skidding in the loose ash. Marla was 50 yards away with the thing that looked like her and it had just pounced on him. By the look of things, it was eating his face. She gripped the club in her fist, a two-foot-long femur bone with a heavy joint at the end, and ran. Up ahead, Marla was in serious trouble. The other her had opened up its head like a snake and was trying to swallow him whole. It was making gagging noises that she could hear even over the pounding of her feet, and beneath them an endless, muffled, awful, wet scream from inside. Marla was throwing wild punches at, his, at its body, but the doppelganger didn't even seem to feel them. Twenty yards and Pan swung the bone up over her head. The creature must have heard her coming because it tried to turn and she caught a glimpse of her own head split in two. She almost hesitated, some part of her unwilling to fight something so familiar, so impossible. That's my face, she thought, and the anger boiled inside her, driving her forward. She swung the club as she moved, arcing it down towards the creature's back. It hit like a demolition ball, a crack that echoed off the mountainside and out over the cliff. The other her folded awkwardly, collapsing, pulling Marlow down with it. His head was completely inside its gaping mouth, and he obviously couldn't breathe in there because he was kicking like a drowning man. Hang on, she yelled at him, lifting the club again. She never got the chance to swing because suddenly the doppelganger was moving, its arms and legs working together like a spider's as it scuttled backwards. Its tissue-thin skin was tearing, revealing something black beneath, as hard as a beetle's carapace. Black and metallic. It moved fast. Marlow dragged behind it. It was still trying to swallow him, its whole body writhing with peristalsis as it forced him down. And all the time it kept those eyes, the same eyes she'd seen in the mirror every single day of her life, on her. She'd bolted after it, chasing it up the, throat, the slope. Even with Marlow gripped in its jaws, it was too fast for her, cutting crab-like to the side. Another few seconds and it would lose her in the contours of the mountainside. She dug deep, her lungs like bucking mules inside her chest. Come on! Come on! The thing zigged one way, expecting her to follow, but she broke right, catching it as it changed direction. She swung wildly, the knuckled tip of the thigh bone catching its arm and causing it to collapse. One of Marlow's shoulders was lost in the cavern of its mouth, its throat bulging obscenely as it worked him down. He wasn't moving any more. Marlow! She lifted the bone again and brought it down on the doppelganger's back, the noise like she'd struck a fire hydrant. She heard it squeal even past the blockage, and she hit it again, her arm muscles burning with the effort. It was choking now, panicking. 
Die! She screamed at it, hitting it again and again. Just die, you mother! It retched, regurgitating Marlow from its throat. He slid free, a lump of wet meat. And the thing scuttled away, its metal parts glinting. It took one last look at her, its mouth a grotesque open sack, its tongue hanging out like old rope. Then it pushed its face into the ground and tunnelled like a digging dog, vanishing. Somehow Pan found the strength to move, crawling to Marlow's side and placing a hand on his neck. His skin was streaked with layers of dark metal, engine metal, but there was no sign of gears, no moving parts. She pressed her fingers there, searching for a pulse. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Come on, she said, using her other hand to pound his chest. Nothing. Come on, she yelled. You're not leaving me here alone. Again. Nothing. Nothing. Thump. He sat up. Whoop. A spray of black fluid erupting from his mouth. His hands grabbed her, fingers gouging her skin, and for a second she thought she'd been tricked, that this really wasn't Marlow at all but another doppelganger. His eyes, though, his eyes were copper pennies, glinting, but so full of terror that he could that there could be no doubt those eyes were human. Hey, hey, she said, both hands clutching his shoulders. Hey, Marlow, it's me. She didn't exactly blame him for not believing her. It's me, she said again. Marlow was hauling in breaths like he was having an asthma attack, shuffling backwards. If he wasn't careful, he was going to end up retreating off the cliff. It's me, she said again. Pan, your name is Marlow Green. Uh, I met you on Staten Island. You lived with your mum. Your brother's name was Danny. Marlow slowed. His face was slick with gunk, his hair plastered to his scalp. Flecks of iron glinted darkly, his irises burning machine bright gulped and shook his head. I don't believe you, he said. That, whatever that thing was, it knew stuff too. It didn't know you snore like a warthog, she said. It didn't know that you were jealous of a Frenchman called Torp. It didn't know that the first time you tried to kiss me, I need you in the family jewels, hard. He lifted a hand to his mouth, biting his knuckle like he hadn't eaten in a week. But she could see the way his body relaxed. She could hear the gentling of his breaths. Technically, you kissed me, he said eventually, his voice shaking. He managed to smile, and for an instant she thought about kicking him off the cliff in herself. Instead she did something that took her by surprise, something she didn't even know was happening until she'd thrown herself to her knees and wrapped her hands around him. He fought her for all of a second. Then she felt his arms around her, squeezing, and suddenly her body was betraying her again. She buried her head into his neck, into the disgusting sulphur stench of him, and she began to cry. I didn't think you were coming, she said, or tried to say. The sobs were too powerful. I thought I was going to be... I thought... Hey, he said. And she realised that he was crying too. Hey, Pan, Pan, it's okay. She wasn't sure how long they stayed like that, bound to each other in hell. It could have been a minute. It could have been forever. It was Marlow that started to pull free, and she wasn't sure if she could let him go. Sorry, he said. It's just that you're kneeling on my leg and it's really painful. <laughs> she was, she saw, her knee planted in his shin. She rolled away, pushing herself to her feet, just to prove that she was still capable of standing. Marlow held out his hand and she hauled him up, both of them smudging tears from their faces. She tried not to notice the fact that he was naked. Better, she asked, when she could find her voice again. He spluttered a laugh. <laughs> oh yeah, sure, he said. I've never been better, Pam. What happened back there, she said. You did it, right? You destroyed the engine. In the ten seconds after they took you, he replied. Even I'm not that good, Pam. She frowned. What are you talking about? Ten seconds? The demons came for you, Pan, Marlow said. They tore you to pieces. Uh, yeah, Pan said, but that was like a day ago. She had no way of knowing for sure, of course, because this place, wherever it was, seemed to flick from day to night in a heartbeat, but it had certainly felt like a day. What, Marlow said, shaking his head. No, Pan, it was just now. It was minutes, seconds. Pan blew out a long breath, staring over the edge of the cliff. It didn't make sense, but then nothing that had happened in the last few weeks, few years, made any sense. Marlow took a step towards her, but she held out her hand to stop him. I thought you might have destroyed it, she said. I thought that's why... I thought maybe it's why you... 
She couldn't bring herself to say it, and the unspoken words hung in the air before her. I thought that's why you hadn't come. Because she'd spent the last day thinking she was alone here, thinking that she would be alone for the rest of time. Herc and Charlie are still there, Marlow said. They might be able to end it. Without contracts, Pan said, shaking her head. You and I made the deal to travel between, to stop time. Without us, I think they'd have been pulled back into the present, into the engine. They'd have ended up right in his lap. Ostheim. If that was true, then he'd have murdered them without a second thought. Marlow wiped his eyes again, staring out to the horizon. A day, he said. You see anything? Sure, she snapped back. I read the guidebook, checked out some sites, bought a snow globe with a demon in it. She took a shuddering breath as she looked out over the landscape of ruin. Look, I appeared here, same way you did. The ground, I don't know, making me. She clenched her fists. The thought of it, of those little threads that had woven her from the dirt, from the black liquid inside those glass tubes, made her want to scream the world away. I didn't do much, couldn't do much. It was all too... I don't know. Then it got dark. I spent the night here, and the next day I started exploring. Didn't go far. I, I kept coming back, just in case. In case what? Marlow asked. In case you, or anyone, showed up. Somebody. She said. Far as I can tell, this place is... I don't know. It's a, it's a city. Long dead. A city? Asked Marlow. So we're on Earth? Did you see any landmarks? Anything we can use? She squinted at him through the dust. Then she turned to the horizon, to a distant smudge of darkness that polluted the sky like an oil slick. I saw... something. A noise broke the silence of the hillside, a rattle of gravel and bone. Bone, excuse me, bone. Pan flinched, scanning the rocky terrain, expecting to see another her or another Marlow walk towards them, smiling. She searched the ground, found the femur, and hefted it up. We should go, she said quietly. This place, it's not nice. Not even close. You have any idea what this place even is? He asked as she started walking, her bare feet crunching through bones, through skulls, tatters of skin caught between her toes. How many dead were here? How many corpses did it take to make a mountain? She thought of the creatures that squirmed down there, wearing stolen faces, ready to open their mouths and swallow her whole. Hell, she said. How could it be anything but hell? How are we doing for time? Yeah, we're all right. The next chapter is called Put Some Damn Clothes On. Look, I don't want to lower the tone or anything, Marlow, but you do realise you're naked. Marlow ignored the question, staring at Pan, studying her properly for the first time. Like the imposter that had tried to eat him, she was made up of layers of flesh and metal, her skin streaked and striated. Striated? One of those two. Like she'd been chipped from the wall of a copper mine. Her face was her face, but marbled by a diagonal streak of dark metal that stretched down her chin, down her cheek, sorry, and over her chin. In one hand, she still held that leg bone, swinging it with every step. She was wearing a white tee and jeans that looked like they were held together by a hope and a prayer. It was a good look. He half thought about covering himself up, but the honest truth was that it didn't seem to matter anymore. He was in hell. He was doomed to an eternity of suffering. Clothes didn't exactly seem like a priority. All the same, he angled himself away from Pan, asking, So where would you get the t-shirt and jeans from? She looked down at herself, brushing a cloud of dust from the shirt. I found them, she said, just lying there. There's stuff all over. It must have belonged. She cut herself off, and Marlow finished the sentence in his head. To the dead. Look, just put this on, yeah, she said, tugging something free from the dirt and lobbing it at him. He snatched it, hard enough to re release a halo of dust, shaking it out to reveal a section of grey cloth. It was filthy and greasy to the touch, but he wrapped it around his middle like a beach towel, just so that Pan would stop staring awkwardly at the horizon. Thanks, he said. Where were you at Christmas? It's what I always wanted, a loincloth from a dead man. He looked at the corpse Pan had pulled it from, nothing left of it but a knotted section of spine and half a pelvic bone. He rubbed his throat, grimacing. It hurt to move, hurt to swallow, hurt to breathe. He'd almost been one of the dead, too, swallowed into that awful, airless, crushing dark. One of the deader than dead, really, because he wasn't sure how that really worked when you were in hell. He glanced at Pam, still wary. He had no idea if it was actually her, but this one seemed right. And what choice did he have? Anything was better 
than the thought of being here alone. She started walking again, and Marlow followed. Every other step, his bare foot would plunge ankle-deep into the bone dust, shards embedding themselves in his skin. He stood on those glass tubes too, releasing gouts of black fluid that was as dark as ink. Pam was leading them along the edge of the cliff, and now the path they were on, if you could call it a path because it was just another section of crushed bone, sloped eagerly downwards. He wasn't sure how long they'd been walking. Time was slow here, treacle thick. It felt a hundred degrees hotter. Marlow wiped his brow, but it was bone dry up there. Oh no, said Pan. No sweat. Weird, right? It will save money on antiperspirant, he said. Pan stopped, planting her hands on her, on her, hip, on, on her hips. Marlow, you seem pretty chill about this whole going to hell thing. He blew a laugh from his nose, but there wasn't much humour in it. Pam was right. He should have been rolling on the floor, screaming away the last of his sanity. But the truth was his brain was doing a ra remarkable job of taking it in his stride. This was weird, yes. But he'd seen weirder. And he'd seen worse. Hey, he said with a shrug. This is bad, but it's got to be better than the old hood back in Shaolin, right? Her frown deepened. You're nuts, she said. You don't have to be crazy to work here, he said with an insane giggle, but it helps. Besides, you're not exactly losing it. I, she started, then shook the words away. He didn't push it. He didn't need to. Pan had arrived here alone. Nobody to talk her through the horror. Nobody to hold her. He couldn't imagine what she must have gone through when she first opened her eyes. That was it, he realised. The reason he felt so calm. That no matter where they were, no matter what would happen next, Pan was here. She wiped a hand over her face, her whole body shaking. Then she looked up at the sky. It was bright, even though the sun was hidden behind the clouds of ash. It's going to get dark soon, I think, said Pam. We shouldn't be outside. You got somewhere to go? he asked. She stuck out the femur bone, pointing at the city below. They were low enough now for Marlow to make out the streets, or what was left of them. Most were hidden by sweeping dunes of dark ash and buried in shadow from the ruined towers. Bands of black dissected the view, huge snake-like constructions that might have been pipes or conduits stretching as far as he could see, the con and converging on the horizon, ending beneath a distant, darker cloud. There was a hum in the air, he suddenly noticed, one that seemed to make his entire skull vibrate. He stuck a finger in his ear, wiggling, but the noise was coming from all around him. There was a smell, too, the familiar gagging stench of sulphur. There, Pan said, pointing to a cluster of skeletal shapes. There was something red fluttering between the white, reminding him of the scraps of meat in the teeth of the creature that had tried to eat him. What? he said, then understanding. Wait, you want me to wear it? Marlow, that towel is going to come off any minute. You either put some clothes on or watch me gouge out my own eyes. Nice, he said, blushing, as he hopped across the path and pulled the cloth free. It was a pair of shorts covered in stains from substances he had no desire to identify. Really, he said, holding them up to Pan. Really. He stepped into them, tightening the drawstring. Trapped beneath the same collection of old bones was another scrap of cloth, this one harder to retrieve. It came free with a tear, and he held it up like a tattered sail. A t-shirt, the logo faded beyond recognition. He was just pulling it on when there was a rattle behind them towards the top of the slope. Pieces of bone pattered down around his feet. Pan held up a hand, holding them both in silence for a full minute. Come on, she whispered, stepping past him and walking swiftly down the hill. He ran after her, and they made their way without speaking both of them casting nervous glances back up the vast, shadowed bulk of the mountain. There was no sign of anything living up there, but the slope was pocked with craters and hills. His skin was crawling too, like there were eyeballs pressed right up against his flesh. He didn't know how much longer it was when he skidded down the last section of the hill, skulls and bones skittering out across a cracked and broken street. Pan had been right. It was getting darker, the shadows growing longer. The generator hum in the air was louder now, like he had a bumblebee inside his head. Are you feeling that? he asked Pan. She nodded, grimacing. It was the same last night, she said. It gets weirder. You got any idea where to go? She nodded towards the nearest building. It was an immense concrete corpse, its crumbling flesh pierced by huge shards of steel, all the way up to where its top floors were shielded by the smoke. 
That place looks wrong, he said. Something screamed, the noise distant but still somehow deafening. Marlowe pressed himself up against Pan before he even knew what he was doing. She didn't move away and he could feel her tremble. The shriek came again, closer this time, then again from another, another direction, and only then did Marlowe recognise what he was hearing. Demons, he said, and Pan nodded. They come out at night, she said quietly. There are hundreds of them. Oh, great, he muttered. Three more screams, and the streets were darkening at an alarming rate. He didn't know much about this place, but it didn't take a genius to work out that if they got stranded outside, then bad things were going to happen. The building was a hundred yards away, behind one of the snaking pipelines that crossed the city. The pipe was as tall and as thick as a car, a knotted cord of metal rings and tubes and fleshy parts that looked almost like muscle. Marlow put his hand on an exposed section, and the hum inside his head seemed to double in strength, pulsing. A supernova of darkness exploded in his vision, a darkness that coiled like snakes, that parted to reveal a figure there as big as a mountain, one that watched him with a cluster of insect eyes. It was like something was pulling him, or part of him at least, a magnet trying to tease out the shrapnel in his skin, in his muscles, in his organs. He snapped his hand free, staring at Pam. She had clamped her hand under her armpit, her body spasming like she'd had an electric shock. You see that? she said. I felt it, he answered. Is there another way around? A shriek answered him, coming from close behind. He searched the rubble, seeing nothing, turning back to see Pan lobbing the femur over the top of the pipe. She followed it, yelping as she dropped down the other side. <sighs> he sucked in a lungful of air and climbed, ignoring the pain, ignoring the figure who thumped into his head. He jumped, landing on a pillow of ash. As soon as he let go of the conduit, his skull stopped buzzing. But it left, but it felt like it had left a mark there, greasy fingerprints on his thoughts. He shook it away to see that he was at the base of a drift that covered the lower floors of the tower. Hurry, said Pan, already scaling the slope. He started after her, struggling with the effort. It was almost dark by the time they scrabbled through the broken window and onto solid ground. Marlow leaned against the frame, seeing that they were in a large space that could once have been an open-plan office. It was completely empty. Where now? he panted. She didn't answer, but Marlow could see her shrug, her body an ink spill against the dark. He heard her shuffle closer, felt her press against him, and he fumbled through the night, found her hand. He squeezed, and she squeezed back. I'm glad, she whispered into his ear. I'm glad you're here. Glad I got torn to pieces and sent to hell, he said. Jeez, thanks, Pan. Her other hand slapped him across the shoulder and he had to stifle a laugh, pinching his nose to hold it at bay. Even so, it still came out as a wet snort. It seemed crazy that he was having to hold back laughter, but then how else were you supposed to fight? It was the only weapon he had here. I take it back, Sam, uh, Pan said, letting go of his hand. He could still hear the fear in her voice, but it was quieter now. It had lost some of its power. I'm not glad, she said. A fresh round of screams had started up outside and he waited until they died down before speaking again. What now? Nothing, she said. The dark, it's... It's like some kind of wild dream, Marlow, a nightmare. You can't see anything. But I don't think they can either. If we're quiet, they might not be able to find us. Sit still, be quiet, said Marlow. That sounds like one of, one of Herc's plans. This time it was Pan who breathed a laugh, but it was short-lived. Marlow wondered where the old guy was now, whether he was still alive. Charlie too, and Truck, abandoned in Venice. He half hoped they'd all show up here by the, the way he had. Better to enter hell with an army by your side, right? But none of them had been under contract. If they had died, they'd have gone somewhere else, or nowhere at all. Outside, a demon howled, the sound half pig squeal and half death rattle, too close. It won't be long, Pan said, night here isn't like back home, just be quiet and stay in the dark, and they won't find us. And the words were still leaving her mouth when the sky began to burn. Uh oh, I think we'll, uh, we'll leave it there today, we'll do a short one today, because we've got this deadline. But um, join me again very soon for the next chapter. It's called The Wall. Not The Wall. A different wall. Um, 
so yeah, I hope you're all well. I hope you're enjoying uh, October or whichever month it is that you're in. We're not too far away from Halloween at this exact moment in time, and I'm looking forward to that next week. Hopefully I'll get another couple of chapters done before then. We shall see. But anyway, have a great day. Mwah. I love you all. See you very soon. And take care and uh, watch out for demons. Bye.